going to hand over to David, who's our who's going to introduce the subject today. Mm -hmm. He's our main speaker, etc., and is the person who's leading the project. So let me click to the next. So, as always, let's just be inclusive. We've tried to create an inclusive space. Um, that means that you know we we try and you know make sure they're respecting you know all the things that are on the screen there, uh, and most importantly, it's about treating each other as equals. Um, this could be um, quite a technical meeting at different points. So if we will try, and David and I have down looked at this presentation many times, we've tried not to use technical jargon. But if there is something and you want to just pop it in the chat or pop your hand up and somebody will just correct um, if you don't know what that is and um, whatever that is, you know, if, if we are using jargon. Um, I have put everybody onto mute and we'll continue to do that while I chair the meeting. If you wish to ask a question, um, we've got specific times that we're going to try and use Mentimeter to really capture all your thoughts, etc. But we have got time in there to ask questions, to have kind of discussion. So it's about using your raised hand function at the top there. And I will see those in in the order of whoever was first and I'll bring you in. And then I think really importantly, we're going to use the car parking system, which means that so I've got Chris's hand up. Oh, no, his hand's gone straight back down. Whether you were just testing that, Chris, um, but we're going to use this car parking, which means if there's something that you raised today that isn't necessarily in, in David's mind or in what we're doing, we want to capture that. So we put it in the car park, we bring it up at the end and say, this is what we're going to do with your part here so again this is why it's really good to have colleagues um so without further ado i'm going to bring in david um who can introduce the the subject today david over to you Brilliant. thank you simon and thanks to the rest of the public participation team for, for helping put this together um it's great to see so many people interested and in coming along uh and i'm really excited to get your thoughts but like someone said, if there's anything that's technical or doesn't make sense that I've talked about, feel free to raise a hand or pop a question in the chat and I'm happy to sort of clarify and make sure I'm saying everything clearly. Um, yeah, so if we jump to the next slide, Simon, this today's meeting is about a piece of work that I'm, I'm leading on, which is to do with our uh, engagement strategy uh, plan and evidence base. But today I'm going to be talking about the strategy rather than the evidence base and the action plan. So this is sort of all about how the council engages around climate change and net zero. Um, and the strategy will kind of be about the why, the action plan and the evidence base will probably be more internal documents about what we're specifically going to do and, and how we measure that. So, yeah, the, what is the engagement strategy? Uh, it's a document which shares our approach for delivering communications and engagement on climate change. And it draws on research as well as the experience and examples of work done by the council and other organisations in the city. So really, it's about why and how uh, should we engage on climate change? So jump to the next slide, Simon. So what isn't the strategy? I think um, one thing I've tried to do in the work I've done so far is make sure that it's not a council only document. It's something hopefully that could be used by other organisations or people in the city if they wanted to, if they were doing work around this area. Um, as well, it's not a plan containing a strict set of actions that the council is committing to or a final word um, or something we're telling other people to do. If that makes sense. And so what's the reason I'm writing this strategy? Well, it's primarily to build our knowledge and skills at the council. So climate change and communications, engagement, um, behaviour change. These are all relatively sort of uh, new ish areas of work and not not things that are necessarily uh, people who work in council communications might be familiar with. So really it's about embedding and understanding about the intricacies of some of these things at the council. Um, but it's also to set out sort of what are, what we publicly saying about how we will do these things. And I think that's important to create a sort of level of, of accountability um, in how we take this work forward. Um, and as well, another another reason for doing it is it's, it's to finish a piece of work um, started by the task force, which was previous body prior to, to my uh, team that I work in now. So just a quick tangent to explain that last point, the task force was something that was created at the council after the um, climate change emergency declaration in 2019. So this was a kind of group of 
council officers and some external um, partners who all work together to come up with the action plan which the council is working to at the moment and once that plan was made the, the task force disbanded but they did do some some work which wasn't published around content engagement which is also feeding into this this piece of work that i'm working on so i'm going to start with sort of um by talking about the role of council in climate change more broadly um so you probably you might be familiar with the council's net zero target of 2030 so net zero is the idea that we get our uh, greenhouse gas emissions down to as near zero as possible so that the amount of greenhouse gases being absorbed out of the atmosphere are equal to the ones that we're producing and therefore we're not contributing to, to global warming and making climate change worse over time so this these stats here about sort of um what level of influence do councils have over emissions? So we've made this target of net zero. How much do we actually control? Well, it's estimated that local authorities on, on average control directly about 2% of the UK emissions and under their influence have about a third. So um, that's the kind of level of influence, I guess. In, in Birmingham, that's a little bit higher. We have we contribute about 9% of the city's emissions because we're a much bigger local authority. Um, but yeah. That, that is, I guess it's just a frame that we don't control everything. So it's a really, it's a city-wide goal that involves everyone. So if we jump to the next slide. So this um, is a good sort of onion diagram to, to indicate the different ways that we can do that. So at the, in the core of the onion, in that blue part, you've got um, emissions that come from things that the council directly controls. This would be our buildings, um, our vehicles, um, and things like this. Then as you, as you move out, um, get further and further away from the councils you have things like place shaping to be how we do our transport policy or how we set um, building uh, planning regulations in the city and decide what what types of buildings can get built these can all have an effect on how those spaces are used and what how much emissions are produced uh, by by residents and, and people in the city and then as we get further and further out we've got those those other rings showcasing partnerships and then involving and engaging communi uh, communicating so really, this strategy is focusing on 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 the green, grey, and yellowish uh, bands of the onion, not those those inner bits. It's really thinking about how do we go about uh, involving and engaging and communicating climate change to help get Birmingham to net zero. Um, so jump to the next slide. I've broken this down uh, into sort of three distinct challenges or or methods, you could say. So one way we can do do that is through communicating, telling people about climate change, telling them about what the council is doing and what they can do, which is good. Um, but I think we all know that will only go so far. Lots of people already know about climate change, but we're still in this position where we, we still have a long way to go in terms of dealing with the problem. Um, another thing we can do is, is behaviour change. So that's making um, sustainable behaviours more easy to do, more affordable, more uh, convenient. Um, and that's, you know, got really that's really important when you think about sort of transport policy um, or, or things like that, where you want to you want to make the most sustainable option the easiest and the most convenient for people. And then another thing we can do is uh, work with uh, citizens in decision making. So a lot of what the public participation team do at the council, how can we include people into our decision making? And also, can we empower them? Um, are there ways that we can support them instead of uh, um, just using them to help us, if that makes sense? And, and those are kind of three three ways that we can help do those um, outer layers of the onion. So we're going to jump to our first Mentimeter um, question. Yeah, it's quite open ended, but uh, we've got the link in the chat to yeah to the poll. Just put it um, in again. So brilliant. So you once you've opened this once, that's that's the only time you'll need to open Mentimeter. It will follow along, and this is a free text. Um, you know, when David and I was chatting this morning and, and last week about, you know, we want to hear what you think. So how best could the council use this influence? Um, we want to think, hear what you think, not what we think. Um, so, yeah, I'll give you a few minutes to open the link to type your thoughts and we'll start picking them up as they populate live on the screen. Except I need to press that. There you go. I 
I'll let you pick up. Can you see these, David? You're all right with that, yeah? yeah? Got those, yep. yeah, bringing into everything yep. it does. Spelling myths about low carbon tech, heat pumps. Yeah, that's a really good one. Through planning, influence new developments in the city. That's a mm -hmm. massive one. Huge, yeah. huge responsibility of local authorities to set their, yeah. their planning regulations. Prioritising active transport, biodiversity net gain. Yeah, brilliant. Better building standards, lead by example. Yeah, these, are, these are fantastic. Walk the talk, phase out waste incinerator quickly, not allow airport to expand. Yeah, so I think that's that's something we'll touch on later is about not just saying, but doing as well and, and sharing mm. that. Mm. Turn to power. Examples of best practice. Yeah, brilliant. Funding, money, speech development. Make being green appealing. That's an interesting one. Yeah, I think that, that is that's yeah. a really good point. Yeah. Community forums. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like a really good good mix of of answers there and and, yeah. and lots of stuff. That's um some things we're we're already looking into, but yeah, definitely a lot, a lot. A lot of really knowledge bar. That one's quite a good one as well. The council should be more confident in imposing regulations when it comes to emissions. Again, I think that fits in with what you were though saying, David, earlier on. Is also we've got to get our own house in order as well. So it's just it's a little bit of the both, isn't it? So residential buildings with largest emission source work to support efficiency of all homes. Yeah, it's something you've dis we've discussed and supported around the going into schools and talking about net zero, etc. Um, yeah. So we've had fifty three answers, um, and what we will do is we'll we'll come back when we've got this. We'll capture everything. We'll feed it all back to you. Um, but I want to be able to for for David to carry on. But that's a brilliant start. Um, and this will keep going. So if you have another thought. I'll keep this open for 24 hours. So if you want to add something else, and obviously we're also getting stuff in the chat as well, we'll capture it all and, and, and write a report back to you all, which you'll get. So I'm going to mute myself again, David, and back over to you, mate. All right. OK, well, those are really great answers. And yeah, definitely um, excited to look look through those in more detail. So I'll just cover the topics I'll go from this on the rest of the slides. Um, so. I'll be running through the structure basically of, of the strategy. So really looking at the introduction, what that will cover, the local chapters on local context, and then it'll, it'll be focusing on each of these three different uh, methods of, of doing that wide engagement, communications, behavior change, and then collaboration. Uh, so if we jump to the next slide. So the introduction, what will I cover in this? Well, what we're thinking is, you know, outlining why climate uh, engagement is needed and all the answers you just gave are really good examples of, of that. So net zero basically is a, is a challenge that can't be achieved by the council alone. It really is um, a citywide uh, project and something we really all need to, to work together on. And the council's role in that, I think, as, as you, most of you seem to agree, is to show leadership and to, to take a lead and, and to engage um, this population around that. So the introduction will also cover the purpose of the strategy, who is involved, and then set out um, a vision and objective. So what the goal is and how, how do we measure success um, of the actions we take? So if I jump to the next slide, Simon. So yeah, jumping into that first section about local context. So I really wanted to start by thinking about what aspects of, of this area are specific to Birmingham. What are the things that we should consider when we're, we're talking about Birmingham and climate change? Uh, so this is a great quote from the IPCC, which is the UN body uh, on, on climate change, the science scientific body who police research um, on it. And they say that narratives that help explain where a community is and where it wants to go and how it intends to get there are an important enabler of transformation. So I think it's really about sort of um, seeing in the place that you live that there's there's a clear idea of what what this future could look like and, and how, how we get there. And that's that's something I think that's important. So when thinking about climate change and local challenges and opportunities, 
key things I wanted to consider were what are the economic, social and historical contexts around Birmingham and how do they fit and respond with climate change? So really I'm thinking about some of the challenges, but really high levels of fuel poverty in Birmingham, um, high levels of air pollution uh, and, and issues around sort of, uh, you know, people see us as the city of the car and things like this and, and some of the negative associations that come with that. So really, are there ways that we can communicate the benefits of, of climate action with tackling some of these, these grander challenges? Um, so we jump to the next slide. One example of that, um, just to sort of illustrate this, would be looking at deprivation and the links it has to vulnerability and um, emissions. So this is a map of Birmingham showing relative deprivation. Uh, with the dark green colours being in the sort of top one, two or three percent of the country in the most deprived areas uh, and the lighter colours being less deprived in, in the lower percentiles of, of the UK's national average. And, and deprivation means that when your living standards means you don't have an access to the what's seen as necessary um, to live a good quality of life. So as you can see, there's there's these areas in the sort of centre and, and east, east of Birmingham are really uh, more deprived than others. If we jump to the next slide. We can see, so this is a map that shows relative emissions per person, uh, blue showing the lowest and red showing the highest emissions. So we can see that those areas that are deprived typically have some of the lowest levels of emissions per person. So these people are not um, often living high carbon lifestyles. Um, and in a sense, when we talk about, you know, behavior change and net zero and, and net, still li net zero lifestyles, lots of Burmese population are already living um, net zero lifestyles and I think that's that's a key thing to highlight we don't want to be sort of sending out a message to people that they should be doing something differently when there are many challenges that that face the city and, and people's lives and I think it's more important to be focusing on, on tackling them at the same time and if we jump to the next slide Simon there's a, another layer to this is looking at environmental risk so in a in a, in a world uh, where um, average temperatures are higher and extreme weather like heat waves and flooding is more common where are the parts of Birmingham that are most vulnerable to these heat waves and flooding? Um, so this is the environmental justice map, which the council uh, produced uh, last year. And in red, it shows the most vulnerable wards of the city um, and in green, the least vulnerable. So you can see that Sutton and Coalfield is fairly, fairly OK. It's very green and leafy um, suburb of the city. So well, um, well protected from, from heat waves and, and there's, there's flood benefits to having that. That, that coverage of, of greenery, but in the more sort of um, urban settings, there's more risk of of, of those heat waves, and there's a, there's mm -hmm. a real health risk to our residents there. So, I suppose that's just one example I wanted to share to just kind of give a bit more more colour to what I meant by the different challenges and opportunities um, that the city faces. So, opening it back up to the to the room, really, um, I'd really love to know sort of. Uh, how we can create a fair and inclusive journey to net zero. What are the key priorities and ways of doing this that that, that people see? Yeah. And th this question really came about from a meeting that I, I, I was in last week and, and I spoke to David this morning about that. Actually, it can be quite an exclusive space. You know, there's a lot of people aren't necessarily seen as this is not for me, et cetera, but actually, if we're going to do this, how can it be? You know, how can it be that we are in, in you know, being inclusive um, and, and, and taking people on this journey with us rather than doing two? So hopefully that helped to shape your thinking on this. So we've got a couple there, retrofit support for the for those on low income, um, which I know there is there's many schemes about, but not necessarily all perfectly fitting um follow the policies laid out of the urban forest master plan i don't know anything on that david i don't know if you do <laughs> that's all right yes yeah my colleague yeah. simon needle um leads on leads on that right plan. Cool. yeah it's implementation yeah. works closely with the planning department yeah. to make sure yeah it goes forward yeah I mean, reach out to deprived areas, include ill voices, really, really important. It's a, it's what we as a new directorate are really about. And that is going to be something that, again, we would want your help, your support, your involvement in doing that we meaningfully reach out and engage and take people on that journey. So I, I really like that one as well. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything that you are picking yeah, out there, David. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, 
Birmingham City Council is the largest landlord and can be a major player in reducing emissions from homes. Yeah, I think mm. that's that's spot on, and that's something the mm. council is looking at. Housing department at the moment um, mm. are working on a decarbonisation plan to how they can get their own mm. um, stock down to down to mm. net zero and lead the way and show that leadership. Mm. Just fuel poverty, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a real priority of the council yeah. and the thing. Yeah. And there's a couple around that, like link family to the cost of living issues, et cetera. So I think, you know, there's there's a theme that's also coming through there. Um, um, Simon, that yes, David, should, should I just sort of go over some of the things that come up in the chat? Because not everybody likes yeah, please. Menti, yes. and that's yeah, absolutely really fine. If people, you, yeah, yeah, if people prefer to put in the chat, that's absolutely fine. And, and it will all be picked up as well. So um, we've got some action centres with computers and people who can help non-electronically geared public to get information and give views. Um, news of achievements, particularly from the grassroots, a media policy with local radio and TV. Um, someone said Bir Birmingham and even more black country people have a great technical hand hands out culture. Um, don't know whether that person wants to come in and talk a little bit more about that. Great choice, great chance of picking up new skills as in retrofitting. Um, there's been a link put in the chat by Darren, Earth Hub. Um, change the behaviour of the rich, John has said, and higher residential density, the lower the individual stats is quite misleading, he said. Don't know whether uh, you want to follow up with that yet. Yeah, I. Um... If, if that's referring to the per capita emissions, so that'll be per person. Um, but you're right, the higher the residential density, the lower the individual stats. I think that is because that is generally a trend that we see. If you live in sort of a, a very dense city, uh, your lifestyle is kind of less less intense in terms of the emissions it's produced, whereas if you're traveling a lot or, or living more rurally, it tends to be quite higher. But yeah, you're right, there's less people there as well. Uh, thanks, David. Um, John has said good environmental justice. Um, Ewan says one of the key issues is to Greater Birmingham that the rich folks don't want to leave, but that trips to the country or foreign holidays, that's about making this a clean, green and safe, beautiful city. Um, Sandy said the red parts most vulnerable are also the areas which have the least greenery. Uh, there's a whole strategy with our planning colleagues going on around the future city um, that hopefully, Sandy, you can get involved in. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of things I just wanted to as well, if you're all right, Amanda, around yeah, cycling. Sorry. So it's fine because I think there is this. There, I think there's a really big part of where what we want to do is make Birmingham a, a a cycle friendly city. As somebody who used to cycle all their time until they moved to Birmingham, um i i was horrified in this city but as now as an e-bike owner i find it easier and that but the problem is is there's no facilities in and around e-biking so i think cycling is also definitely part and again a big theme that's coming across so we've got that kind of economic but then there's also you know birmingham city council does a cycle to work schemes and things like that so um i'm going to keep that going because i want to not push on to not have those conversations but we want to get through so that you can have more time towards the end to be part of those discussions but that's really great we've got 48 people have, have popped there and we will capture everything in the chat as well so i'll move it to the next for you david yeah yeah so sort of carrying on with that 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 topic um one one other thing I sort of wanted to consider was about sort of the city narratives, and I guess this is how we think of Birmingham as a place and its history and, and where it's going in the future. So you know, the ideas around the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, um, imperial links across the globe, and the post-war rebuild of the city, some which brand it sort of the city of the car, and uh, deindustrialization, immigration, and diversity of the city. And I guess thinking about how can we capitalise on our current moment? Are we in golden decade of investment, which is what a lot of the uh, political leaders um, put forward about the Commonwealth Games and HS2 and, and this decade, um, and a real sort of focus on, on building civic pride around Be Bold, Be Birmingham and, and a bolder, greener brand branding. Um, another narrative could be the green industrial revolution that we're sort of seeing in, in things like the Ties of the Energy uh, District, um, 
in East Birmingham, which sort of focuses on a lot of renewable energies and industry. And then as well, a recognition that, um, you know, for, for lots of people, their, their local community often is, is the frame which they, they, they see the world around them, whether that's something like Balsall Heath or Acox, Green Air or um, any other parts of the city with a real sort of strong local identity. Quite often, these can be harnessed into sort of positive climate action. So I guess it's being aware of that and, and what can be done there. Jump to the next slide, Simon. Yeah, just to touch on a few more of those points. Um, yeah, cultural and, 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 and demographic diversity. We're a super diverse city now, really multi-faith and a very young city as well. So being aware of these, how can we use those to engage engage people around us? Uh, and there's been some brilliant work by lots of faith communities, uh, Footsteps, Barclay for Trust, EcoSeek have all done great things in the city, uh, reframing the climate issue in, into their into the language of faith and, and making it resonate with a wider audience, which is which is fantastic. So being aware of that as a council, how can we play a role or get involved? And I suppose kind of what we all sort of discussed with um, but the previous comments you made on, on, the, on the last Mentimeter question was about, yeah, these challenges and opportunities, how can we tackle the issues and and put forward uh, positive climate action at the same time? I think one way people frame this and the council has framed it is in this idea of a just transition. So in 2019, when we made the direct declaration and the, the target to be net zero by 2030, it was, um, I think the phrasing was net zero by 2030 or as soon after as a just transition allows. So, I suppose it's what do we really mean by that? Can we put more um, meaning onto that phrase just transition? Is it about take, looking after the most vulnerable first and, and and making sure that we tackle other issues at the same time? Um, is it about helping people whose livelihoods may be dependent on kind of high um, greenhouse gas emitting activities like taxi drivers, for example? Are they being supported into a more sustainable way of doing their work or other industries in the city? What can the council do in, in, in these roles? So that's that's kind of um, where I was, where I was thinking with those. And so yeah, just one quick quick another quick poll um, for you all. What what are your thoughts? And and are we missing anything in the local context? Mm. I can see we've had a few comments come through as well. So I could I come. Yeah, to we have. Uh, I, I really like the one about utilising the canal networks. Um, I, I I think you know that's that's not the first time I've heard it, but it's really interesting. I'll uh, I'll make this so that we pops up the answers. But again, it's your thoughts. Have we missed something? Is there something that you're doing, um, et cetera? You know, um, lost contact with audience, activate slide. There you go. But hopefully it now works. It may be my internet. Technology can be an answer to so many of these things, but when it doesn't work, it's a problem. Um, you know, what are your thoughts? Do you think that context is correct? Uh, think we're missing something? I'll give you a few minutes. Yeah, any thoughts on the historical context or sort yeah. of how Birmingham kind of talks about itself would is 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 really welcome. So a really great comment from uh, Ewan. Cost always comes into the active travel discussion, yeah. but a low cost option uh, that they've been talking about for years is to change timings on pedestrian crossings to favour active travel over cars. Mm. I think that's definitely something we should look into. Mm. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass that on to colleagues in transport team. Sandy says the golden decade of investment has missed the huge opportunity to connect all the buildings to the district energy scheme in the city centre due to past planning intransigence. Has this changed? Yes, the um, so the district energy uh, scheme, just to give a really quick explainer for anyone on the call who's not familiar with it, it's kind of like um, a giant boiler in the centre of Birmingham that, that heats a couple of really big buildings in the city centre. It's council owned and maintained. And the idea is that if you do, you know, one big boiler for multiple buildings, you can do it more efficiently, less emissions, and it's cheaper. Um, so there's quite a few major sites that are signed up to it. But I, yeah, I think as Sandy's comment indicates, it might not have expanded mm. um, in, in recent years. I'm not I, I, too sure on the ins and outs of that. But I think the other thing is just to let people know, and I'll, I'll send this out here. There is now obviously the, well, it's not obvious, but there is a new scheme around uh, the Future City Birmingham 2040 plan, um, and they are wanted to engage in and around this. Uh, and again, so that when we are 
looking and we we're absolutely there's been missed opportunities they don't want to miss it this time so again it's how can we get you into that space um so i'm going to start getting it's clearly a, a lot of line for the kind of the green revolution um cycling has come here again i don't know if there's anything that you've picked you wanted to um park and ride may encourage people to think differently about how they travel into the city absolutely What budget Simon does account? And, uh, sorry, Simon and yeah. um, David. So the John has said subsidy for public transport mm. that comes up all the time, doesn't it? Mm. Um, Absolutely. Joanna's mentioned about some work um, that she's involved in for the Canal and River Trust. Yeah. Very keen to work with partners around that. More yeah. solar on schools, um, engage universities and college students. Mm. Um, more of a concentration on existing buildings heat density is important yeah. when it comes to capital investment some yeah. great comments in the chat yeah yeah, yeah. I, 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 I i would just wanted to pick out i think one of the things that we can't do um is presume every community in birmingham is is in that same space i think there's if we take that kind of intersectional view of of community it is true so the person is put certainly making sure the pakistani communities are fully aware etc i think that's also could be applied across multiple so i think it's it's going right down to that community level understanding and how do we empower different communities etc um to be part of this so I, I really like that i think that's a really good point and uh, not necessarily on the community that's been picked out but i think we need to have that you've highlighted something that we need to win anybody and everybody to so again we would want if you're part of that community you to be involved to help to shape that so um the city is now a foodie a foodie haven oh it is isn't it um <laughs> Yeah, we have food poverty. Can we do something to create community orchards, growing places, create in zero food miles too? That's a really interesting. Got park and ride again. Uh, public transport again. It's it's something that comes up um, a lot. So, um, I think somebody just tested. Unless they are saying we need test. But, that was um, sorry. That was me, Simon, because um, somebody's actually mentioned that Menti has stopped working, so I was just uh, testing it. Okay. It's still working. Apologies. Uh, yeah, no, no, that's fine. Uh, and it, I think it probably did. It's it's sometimes about connection. So, okay. Um, as I say, that's going to keep going. So please keep populating at your at your will, and I'm going to turn myself back onto mute and hand back to you, Dave. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for those, and 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 like like I said before, we'll. We'll definitely dig into those. And, yeah. So I just at this it's... point, um, and it may be that it's too early now because I think we're probably more ahead of where we kind of thought. I was looking for around the 12 o'clock time to take a break. Um, it's a two hours and there's a lot to go through. Um, but because we're ahead, if people are happy, should we try and take a break around 12? I just want to make sure that people have that moment to get a quick drink, to take a quick comfort break etc and I'm proposing around 12 where I thought we might be in the slides we're probably ahead um is that all right with you David? You're getting lots of thumbs up for that Simon fabulous David. let's carry on then okay thank you but right. obviously it as as uh, I will say if you need a comfort break or want to get a drink at any point you don't need my permission <laughs> please just do just yeah so brilliant okay let's carry on then David Okay, so I'll talk about the next section of the strategy, a section on communications, really. Uh, and what, what this part will, will sort of hope to cover is a summary of, of the research that's already out there, what the key messages and advice for, for the local level and for local authorities. What, how do we find common ground and, and messages that resonate with everyone? And what are some language do's and don'ts, really? And I'd also like to talk a bit about misinformation in it, too, and, 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 and cover some of that as well. So jump to the next slide, Simon. Um, one key thing that's sort of come up from some research that was taking place in Birmingham actually with 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 local residents was about how people conceive of, of, of climate change as an issue and sort of these three different time scales. So they think about an immediate effect, which they mostly associate with their local area, a long a medium term effect, which they associate with their the national 
country, so the UK, and then a long term effect, which is sort of seen as more international. And if we jump to the next slide, Simon. These also sort of translate to the issues they associate with each of those horizons. So the immediate horizon is often associated with pollution and waste and, and cleanliness. And that medium term horizon, uh, the national one is associated with energy and how we decarbonize energy. And then long term and international people think about global CO2 levels, so something a bit more abstract. Um, and what's 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 been shown from the from the residents with or with uh, Birmingham residents is this kind of where they see the prior where the priorities of the local authority kind of lie with and where our own responsibilities are with. And it's really around those that immediate term and medium term uh, kind of horizon, the, the pollution and energy side of things, really. Um, so the key takeaways yeah, that, that these are seen within the, the responsibility of local authorities and, and, and local people. If we jump to the next slide, we can dive into that kind of pollution box into a bit more and, and give it a bit more um, a meaning. And broadly, it means meant three different things to people. Uh, one way of thinking about it was about waste, rubbish and fly tipping. And there was generally lots of support for local policies to go beyond national policies. So. Uh, for the council to be more serious and tougher on this than, than we are nationally. People really want to see action on, on waste. On health, generally associated with air pollution, um, and, and is one of the one of the best routes into climate conversations. If you can start around a conversation around health and air pollution and, and quality of life, that's a really good way to sort of talk about why, why this is related to, to um, climate change and the emissions we're producing. And then, yeah, the final one, transport. Similar to air pollution, people often saw that getting cars off the road was an essential goal in the short and medium term uh, response, even by people who relied on vehicles for everyday life. Um, it's quite an interesting result there from, from those who were involved in the study. I've got some some quotes in the next slide to sort of flush these out and kind of give some more examples on what people said and, and what their reasoning was and what, what can we learn about from, from those responses. So yeah. On pollution, uh, one, one respondent said most immediately, I would say pollution in the environment is the most important issue because it affects my health and anybody that suffers with asthma. In fact, what they're saying is it's damaging young children, even if they haven't got the condition now, it's having an impact on their lungs. So that to me is the most immediate. So yeah, as you can see, air pollution, children's health especially, is a really powerful route into to climate conversations. Um, but one thing, the next quote will illustrate is that with air pollution, people want to be shown why measures are taken and what the money is being spent on. So it's, it's really key that you're not just using it as a this is a problem, but you're sort of saying how and how, why you're dealing with it. If you jump to the next slide, I just did, mate. Yeah. Oh, so I'm <laughs> <It's> behind. <all> right. <laughs> it says, yeah, I'd, I'd want it to tell me what they're going to spend the money on. Is it more green space, and is it going to, um, is it? Is it going to be best to do? Because if somebody said to me, this is your carbon tax, John, you're driving in every day, this is what we're going to do with your money, then you might think, OK, fair enough. So, yeah, I'm sort of iterating what I said before about, you know, really publishing the data and, and making sure of communicating how things are being used is, is really key for mobilising support and making the visible, invis making the invisible visible. So looking at transport, yeah, here's, here's, here's a, a, a typical quote that, that the research found. I think cycling is a fantastic way to tackle the issue. Not only solves congestion problems and pollution problems, but it's a massive impact on people's health. It's a win-win all round. Yeah. Um, so recognising the host of benefits associated. But then on the flip side, but would you want to cycle? There's no cycle lanes in the city centre. You take your life into your own hands. Mm. I know a few people have been um, knocked off or in hospital. So uh, it's really, really key that, you know, where the where the burden is most likely to fall on like um, on normal people when how, in choosing how they transport, there's a real um, real need to make practical incentivization to do it, make it safe and and easy and convenient. So providing an alternative option to the car is sort of seen as essential. In a sense, yeah, and I think as some of the some of the comments that kind of illustrating needs to be safe, and you need to be able to sort your bikes as well. Um, yeah. yeah, jump, yeah, so. This slide, so the other sort of points I was, I was going to cover in this section were really about sort of um, as broad support for local leaders to show leadership in the face of what's perceived as a lack of national leadership from, from the UK government. Um, and, and people also responded quite open and, and, and wanting to see their, their council 
champion this cause and, and, and really holds the government to account in, in lots of ways. People aren't averse, people are averse to the language of emergency uh, if the action taken doesn't reflect that. So it's no good saying we're in a climate emergency if we're not acting like it. Uh, and technical language generally needs to be avoided or explained clearly. Uh, policy and messaging needs to be rooted in the practical and the tangible and backed up by the evidence. It's really that show and tell yeah. and that, that honest communication. I think um, that, that's what the research has highlighted. So yeah, another another sort of bit of research to be drawing on is this um, Britain's sort of climate report by Climate Outreach, um, which is really rooted around what are the common grounds that we can we can agree on. So it, used, it uses a, um, a more uncommon segmentation of, of, of the country, which kind of has these distinct groups that people often fall into in terms of their, their worldview and their political views. Um, and what are the what are the different framings and messages that all those groups can agree on? And quite often it's around protecting future generations, so that responsibility to, to children and future generations, creating a healthier society and preserving our local natural environments, really bringing it back to the to the local, the immediate place and to the people uh, we, we live with. And it really highlights the role of trusted messengers, so environmental charities and, and ordering people have been affected. Um, one thing that I've noticed that with a lot of climate communications, there's generally a high level, sorry, council communications, generally a yeah. high level of scepticisms. You know, yeah. if we, something goes out on our, our Twitter and our Instagram, quite often people, it's, it's, you know, like to criticise the council or don't trust what they're doing. So it may be better that, that we make use of, of local people and, and stories from local communities yeah. um, to really communicate those those messages and what, what, what people can do. Yeah. So yeah, we wanted to, to, to open up to you guys. Um, thinking about communications, are there some real priorities about how um, council should communicate journey to net zero or how we can all talk about it? What do you think are the sort of most effective ways to do this that would, that would mean the most to people? Yeah, and, and I think this is really important because it's about how do you communicate within communi communities, which was difficult for me to say for a moment there. Um, we we have our own channels but actually it's about what else how do we dig down into those more isolated or communities etc um because you may have those links you might have those thoughts um you know amplify messages from campaigners academics faith groups climate experts i think absolutely it's a again we're not necessarily looking for use Facebook or whatever it is that kind of bigger if you've got some and again it might be things in the chat if you want to come in Amanda um mm -hmm. need to get mainstream media on board and communicating these messages um I agree I think it's mixed messages um engagement with schools i.e get kids on board from a young age is the key to positive change I, I agree as a kid who grew up in the Keep Britain Tidy campaign that Blue Peter and others did. I do not drop litter anywhere, um, but it, it really did. It affected me as a kid and you kind of carried that through that now my children have that. So I think winning that younger uh, is going to be important, but um, we need to be able to use the correct tools to engage those. Um, it to be embedded in ward plans, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anything that you've got in the chat that you want to bring up, Amanda? Yeah. While yeah. So Patrick says uh, Patrick's looking for some sort of um, dynamic way. Just tell people that people yeah. tell everyone that people are dying from climate change. Yeah. You know, but um, what else have we got here? Um, someone's mentioned about fly tipping again. Mm -hmm. uh, have a climate change festival every year. Patrick says, might be a good idea. Mm, yeah, it's a great idea. Um, yeah, we're, we're looking into something, not a festival as such, but we really want to try and organise some events around COP28 uh, this year. So when the international negotiations are going on, we've got a few sort of um, events with yeah. schools and other organisations mm -hmm. planned. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. Sandy, Sandy said we should tailor it towards people's daily living, daily lives, what will convince them. Um, Absolutely. I.e., yeah. for example, better comfort at home through excellent insulation, lower energy bills, public transport should be mm. excellent, good quality local environment. Um, maybe people having, you know, um, 
more uh, pride in their local area so that you know mm. you don't drop mm. litter and so on in first mm. place mm. um george is it georgia uh introducing decentralized networks into university degrees it's interesting i had no idea of the benefits until i finished my mechanical engineer she said yeah mm. I, I, there's quite a lot around a theme about local people being that voice empowering local people to to have that voice to convince others etc um so I've, I've kind of highlighted there listen to where people are at and i think that is a really important starting point you know maybe we in this space we may have slightly different opinions on how you get there but we kind of inhabit that this space there's i think of my neighbors i think of my mum i think of others who just kind of go, it's too big an issue for me. I, I, I and kind of switch off from it. So, you know, and giving, you know, those roles and models and examples that are meaningful. Um, and again, somebody put in that about um I've lost it now. It's probably way up there, but around mm -hmm. how you empower local people to take, you know, actions collectively together. So um and Nigel says but um, Birmingham should be better about coordinating on the climate change issue with other urban areas such as Nottingham, Manchester, yeah. Bristol, London and yeah. so on. Yeah, that's a really good good point. So I, yeah. I personally work yeah, as a core cities network with Nottingham, Manchester and others. Um, so I, I do a lot of sort of sharing what we're doing on comms yeah. and engagement with, with their, my counterparts yeah. in those cities. But yeah, it's really important that we are talking and learning. Yeah. I do like the one of don't get distracted by climate deniers. Um, I I just don't engage in that. I I, I completely agree. Um, <laughs> um, but I think there is a a a a cultural curiosity almost around it. Is that you know for some people it's how do we take people who may be influenced by that and having sensible conversations, but then not getting dragged down, taking on you know some of the leading voices necessarily in this. So, um, I, yeah, I've noticed in here, somebody said competitions mm. are a great mm. way to spark engagement and communities to get on board. I think somebody put in prizes or something in the chat, which I thought was a really interesting way. Um, it is around that remuneration, but actually it's nice to kind of have that celebratory nature to it, you know, so... Um, Frame it as an opportunity for improving health, well-being, etc. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep scrolling down. We've got all these. You'll get them all afterwards. Um, so you'll see them all. And as I've put in the chat earlier on, we will feed back on everything. Um, so but that's great. We've had 50, uh, 52 answers so far. So I'm gonna bring it back to you. And I think after we've done these ones, we could take the break. David, I was going to say, people... so I think it might be a good good time to do it now. The break, if, yeah, if, yeah, 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 yeah. So if, if people are happy, um, we could take and so we could do now until twelve, or if people need that little bit longer, um, but I think it is a natural pause, is where we kind of thought originally, um, to just take that five minutes if you need to get a quick cuppa, comfort break, etc., um. So if we pause here, I'll stop sharing my screen um, and we will come back for just after 12. Um, Ewan's already off. <laughs> it's fine, Ewan, don't go for it, mate. Take the opportunity. Um, yeah, don't leave. Just turn your camera off or and your mics off and we'll see you in five minutes. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Right, I can see some people have come back. We'll give others a few more minutes. Um, yep. Oh, <clears throat> suddenly lots of cameras are flicking on. I'll wait and reshare my screen in a moment. Um, I was most grateful for the five minutes because I definitely needed an extra coffee today. Oh. Mm -hmm. Right, I'll pop this up. Let's give it one more minute. Let me see if uh I'm hoping most people are back now. I can see some people. I can see Patrick's back, Ewan's back, um, Chris is back at the bottom there. Um, but there's lots of people who are still at, oh, yep. Yeah. Hi, Helen. Helen's back. We've got a thumbs up. The Amanda's back. Most importantly, David's back because without him, we, we might have to pause a bit longer. So we'll get started and we can you know we can catch people up as and when they come in um but hopefully that's making the last kind of part of this meeting more comfortable for you all so back over to you david and i think Brilliant. i'm sharing yep over yep. to you mate thanks thanks simon yeah so i'll just jump onto the the next section which is behavior change um so in this part of the strategy we'll be talking about what role behavior change play what behaviors are we talking about and uh, how how should we approach behaviour change? So just to just to kick off, we jump to the next slide. Um, we've got another Mentimeter, so I'd really love to know sort of what people think. How many people out of ten, on average, um, want to make more sustainable choices in their life? So what what's the statistic for the average amount of people that would like to make more sustainable choices in their life? Oh, there you go. We can yeah see the average yeah, we, that comes in. It's quite exciting. Yeah, yeah. it's quite interesting because we we had a really big discussion about this this morning, um, and it is that how many people do you know who who would like to do something but kind of go, I can't afford it, or I've got this. What you know, it's not necessarily the pressure, but we know that I think lots of people would like to do something. I know I'd like to do ever more, but then you know. This, those other societal pressures, work, etc., that kind of come in. But at the minute, we've got um, on average about three point three point six at the minute. Yeah, I think the slide only allows you to pick out of five, so that's a mistake. Oh, around. okay, but that's my that, fault. I'm really sorry. I mean, sorry. that looks that looks yeah. to me around sort of a six or a seven, or maybe an yeah, eight. Yeah, top, but probably a seven. Yeah. Yeah, somebody just yeah. confirmed. I'm sorry, I failed you today, or everybody. I'm really sorry. Um, I should have done it one to ten, but yeah. 
So if we think of one to ten, one to five, then that's actually more, much easier. So yeah. three point six. And um, we'll give that yeah. another couple of minutes. We've had 21 people put it so far. Um, I'm just going to, I don't know if Amanda or Cam could just put the link back in the chat because I'm, I'm I'm aware we might have some newer people in. Um, I might not be able to get hold of Menti yet, but yeah. Thank you, Rachel, for pointing out that, you know, I failed miserably. It's not what you've said, but that's what will be remembered. Right. OK, should we move on, David? Are you happy to do yeah, that? Yeah. So yep. 3.6, um, well, that, that's, yeah. you know, roughly, you know, a, a seven. So Ian's put agree with agree with what, please. So agree again, if you so, want to. Yeah. Sorry, the wording's not great. It's it's how many people out of 10 um, do you think would like to make sustainable life life choices? Um, so if you imagine five being 10 out of 10 and one being one out of 10 or two out of 10. Yeah. So that's what this goes for. Yeah. But I can see that the consensus is, is, is around, you know, seven or eight. Yeah. Um, if we jump I'll on. flick that. Yeah. So the actual, the good news is it's actually nine out of 10. So nine out of 10 people on average uh, would like to make more sustainable choices in their life if, if they're able to. So I, I just wanted to sort of start by highlighting that we're in a, we're in a really good place of, of, of what people would like to do uh, in their mm. lives on climate change. We jump to the next one. <laughs> so. When we talk about climate change and, and the net zero in particular, what behaviours are we talking about exactly? So this is some quite wordy research from the Committee on Climate Change, which is the government's independent body who kind of review uh, climate policy and, and make recommendations. Now, in their scenario of getting to net zero, they estimate that 41% of the reductions will come from things which require no behaviour change. So this could be like the, the national grid becoming decarbonised and renewable um renewable energy sources providing our electricity in our homes etc uh but they also estimate that 43 percent will come from adopting low carbon technology so this is things like heat pumps so how we heat our homes using an electrical heat pump rather than a gas boiler um electric vehicles um, using more public transport as well and then they also estimate that 16 percent will come will need to come from behavioral changes where we probably reduce something we do, like take fewer flights or drive less or change our diets like to uh, eat less meat. So from that, we can see that, you know, there's about two thirds of emissions will require some kind of change from people. So it's really important that we we get a grasp on behavior change and facilitate people to make those. Those um, choices, we jump to the next slide. So one model of, of looking at that is this, this what's called the COM B model. So COM stands for capability, opportunity, motivation, and B for behavior change. So it's really seeing behavior as something that is the product of your capability, your motivation, and your opportunity. So what does that really mean in, in plain English? Well, when we think about capability, is somebody physically or psychologically able to do the behavior? Is it something they can do? In terms of motivation, do they have a conscious or unconscious reason to do the behaviour? You know, what's motivating them? Are they incentivized to do it? And is there an opportunity? Does that, uh, does the physical and social environment enable that behaviour? Mm. Um, so it's really easy to think about this, probably in something like transport or diet. Are you able, let's say you wanted to eat more healthily, are you able <coughs> and physically able to, 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 to buy and cook healthy meals? Mm. It might be that you need uh, recipes or support in, in knowing how to do that. Are you motivated? Do you think there's a benefit to doing that action? Um, is it something your friends are doing that makes it you want to do it more? Uh, and does the physical and social environment enable that behaviour? Are you able to get the ingredients you need to cook them, etc.? So that's kind of one way of, of, of running through um, something you want to achieve and identifying what needs to be addressed to enable people to do that. So hopefully this shows that when we talk about uh, behavior change we're not talking about something that's coercive or nagging or telling people yeah. what to do but really about targeting the economic material and social context uh, and building an environment which makes sustainable options naturally more appealing and, e um, mm. and easy the default choice basically mm. and again so, what we what we want here is your thoughts on behavior change so we've kind of put some there there's been some very already some really interesting things in the chat, uh, which I'm sure Amanda or Cam will bring out. But again, it is that what we missed is, is, is do we think, you know, 
the kind of model that we've we've done, whether we put there is is the correct one. It's not necessarily that we've gone. This is it. This is just one of many. So what are your thoughts on around behaviour change? And I did like Patrick's uh, question of how many people are willing to give something up to make that. I think it is a really important question because people, you know, with little want to hang on to things sometimes. Um, I know that I do. Um, and is that always the best way? So, um, yeah. Mm. What are your thoughts on behaviour change, guys? And I'm hoping the Mentimeter is working. Um, but Amanda, if in between why people... Yeah. Are they, no? So Deborah said changing the values away from material possessions and yeah. consumerism. I know that's a conversation that goes on in my friend circle all the time. Mm. We talk for hours about that subject. Uh, mm. Simon yeah. says many people do want to change, but on, on their terms and their priorities. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I just put in the chat about my own um, experience of having a local market, buying my fruit and veg from the local market. Yeah. Not thought about it at all, but then noticed that my bin was like not even half full compared to how it's full to bursting when I buy my fruit and veg from the supermarket. And obviously yeah. it has a great yeah. knock-on effect of supporting a local community um, Stellar as well. Sandy said a key element is also managing time for lots of people yeah. so that mm -hmm. they do things sustainably and not just dispose of stuff in an unthinking way. Yeah. Um, John says more sharing of equipment. Yeah, that's something that's happened in my local area as well. Yeah. That when things break down, we've got somewhere we can take them and they will try and fix them rather than yeah. just throwing them in the bin. Yeah. Really important. Um, Georgia says rather than charging people and making the ULES the congestion charge penalties make train tickets cheaper, absolutely couldn't agree more. Yeah, and really John says point. composting and all sorts of green gardening, even just in a small window box. Yeah, it's amazing how much space you don't need to do yeah. some yeah. growing of your own veg, isn't it really? Yeah. Green yeah. roof gardens as well is mentioned. Yeah. Some uh, of in the chat. Yeah, so I, I like the one that somebody's put here. People are strong influence for what they think is what everyone else is doing. And that's a really key part of behaviour change. You guys are in a space where you are, I think, in a unique place to be able to shift that kind of social weight into a slightly bigger that could actually begin to then shift that wider social context in there, in that, you know, people do. They look at what other people are doing. Um and 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 for some people they will follow. Um, so I think it's that's a really interesting point. I do like the idea of col collaborate with social and cognitive behaviour psychologists. So if anyone on the call is one of those, we'd be more than happy to to have well, that. Go on, David. So we've we've actually just had there's there's a new team in the in the health department of the council who are um, behavioural psychologists and sort of Fantastic. work on a on yeah, a, yeah. you can load them out go. to different parts yeah. of the council, which is great. That we've answered that already. Well done. Um, I'm just going to scroll down and it comes down to cost retrofit could be 20 to 30 K for a home. EVs, um, not sure what EVs are. Um, Electric vehicles. Ah, yes. OK, yeah, yeah. Are still massively expensive. And I agree, my my electric bike cost me £1,500. Um, but it does mean that I can cycle again now because of my disability. I couldn't. Um, yeah, it's a big investment and not everybody can afford that. Um, so they might use their car if they've got an adaptable car. Um, I would love to know who the what the the person who put answer too long will put in the chat. I'm presuming they have put a long answer in there. Um, but I'm I'm really excited to see what they've written. Um RW harvesting. Um, ah, yes, okay, yep. Um, that's a, yeah, and and that is really interesting because a, a number of years ago I went somewhere where they had these huge kind of under un, built under housing uh, reservoirs to store rainwater, so you could use it for water in your garden and all those kind of things. But the, it had safety measures built in, so the technology is there, but again, it's cost. Um, Behaviour change on a societal level quickly enough can't happen without constraint. Let's take COVID. We we would achieve zero travel worldwide in a couple of months without strict national regulation. Interesting. Yeah, interesting opinion. I think that yeah. touches on the whole 
carrot and stick debate. And I think yeah. the key yeah. thing, I think Georgia's yeah. comment about the, you know, you can, uh, instead of making congestion charges, why not make the public transport more attractive or train yeah. tickets better? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really good example of like, if you act early yeah. enough and facilitate something happening, you can avoid the, the stick that you might need to use later to yeah. keep things in check. So Nottingham, for example, their public transport system is so good that they don't have a clean air zone. They don't, they're not legally required to happen. Whereas Birmingham and lots of other cities aren't as, yeah aren't as doing as well and then therefore we had to had to go down the clean air zone route yeah. as mandated by government yeah yeah i do like the the needs holistic approach not decoupling this from around you know reducing crime tackling and uh, tackling social inequalities etc i think you know david touched on that but again that's something that that is yeah. in there um, maybe it's that social link you know that um yeah. if you see other people doing it around you or if it's yeah. related to the place you live it's that Right of place, then then perhaps yeah. you can sort of link those two issues. Bring back the Birmingham Beach. I'm not familiar with that. No, I I I I heard of it. Um, maybe it was before my time of moving here from the the East Midlands. Um, but I do like the idea of a beach in the. Oh, hang on, wasn't the beach in Centenary Square or something? If I remember, yes, I'm, I can see Amanda nodding. Yes, it was. I do, <laughs> yes. I do remember it now. Yes gosh yeah i mean it's incredible we've got loads of still comments coming through um so i want to move on so we can begin to cap so we're capturing all these um but again so we can move to that point where again you guys can come and contribute in as much as as feasibly possible in time that we have so back to you david Brilliant. yeah thanks for all those responses again I think a lot of this really, it'd be, you know, my ambition is, is when it comes to putting the strategy together is, is pulling some of those quotes from you all yeah. and, and getting those in there because I think it'd be really powerful to, to yeah. have, have your voices in Absolutely. it. So, yeah, the next section or the final one, collaboration. Um, so what do we mean by collaboration, really? Um, with lots of different meanings. And yeah, this, this section will look to summarise the main benefits of meaningful engagement and collaboration. And some of those are, you know, when we talk about net zero and, and, and adapting to climate change, it's a big change that needs public consent and involvement. And we can enrich our democracy by involving residents better, in a better way, like we are today. Um, and it can help us make the right choices as well. I think that's that's the real purpose, is that the insight of, of local people can really lead to better decision making. So, yeah, and the other thing this section will do is outline oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, the principles and, and methods of, of going about engagement. So if we jump to the next slide now. Um, yeah, there's a huge variety of engagement, um, but the categories on the screen at the bottom sort of are good kind of uh, way that we can we can break these down and distinguish between different what we really mean. So, you know, at the very, very shallow end, I guess you could say you've got informing, telling people about something and you've got consulting, which is what happens with a lot of planning policy. We hear opinions and, and try and embrace those and the decisions that get made, but they may or may not be reflected in in what gets decided. Then you can involve people at an earlier stage into the process, or you can co-design where it's a shared process entirely, or empower where you, you literally give power to someone else to do something independently. So it's, it's important to have the council does a range of these across all its areas of work with the public participation team are involved in, in most of these. Uh, board forums yeah. are, are one example, our consultation process. But we've got things like a youth city board, people for public services, which is like this. And things like the neighbourhood network schemes where the budget is decided by um, or how the budget is spent is decided by uh, local people. Mm. So really, I think that the frame of this this topic is how did this best fit with, with, with climate change? How can we make the most of these these different mechanisms and get the real benefits mm. of how the council acts? Just on this bit here, David, normally what we would kind of go and, and, and I think other colleagues is that, that it, it doesn't have to be the empowering could come at the beginning, et cetera. So it, it's a bit of a, a um, I prefer this in a circle um, so that you're not quite sure where it starts, because actually the key here is about you being involved. And again, reiterate that here. Um, but I think all of those, every single point, as David said, is that we would be looking to get you involved in supporting David and his team to make sure your voice is at the centre of it all. So it's again just reiterating that for you, David, that we're here to support you. Um yeah. So happy to Brilliant. move on. Yeah, yeah. Um so I mean this isn't a complete list, obviously, yeah. but this is just an example of various different methods from 
formal things like assemblies and juries where you get a collection of citizens who are randomly selected and represent their, their population to make recommendations on a policy. Something uh, more informal, citizen researchers, where you're using citizens to go and find something out for you mm -hmm. and work with them, or uh, dialogue workshops, community conversations, all these sorts of things. So there's a range of different methods. And if we jump to the next slide. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the key points I want to highlight in this in this strategy is is that the method should sort of come after you've decided what isn't isn't being up to debate and how you're going to use people's inputs. So I think I think like uh, like some of the comments have said, you know, people need to be seen that their participation has an effect and an outcome and makes a difference. Yeah. And I think when that happens, that's probably when you get a really good feedback loop of you know you, the, these people have helped help the council and 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 also you know felt like they're being listened to. So yeah. I think it can really help build momentum on that. So it's really about making sure that your your method decision comes after you've ironed out what you're actually mm. looking to go to people for. Mm. So that, that's me covering that section. We'll open up to you. How do you think we can collaborate better? And are we missing anything? Do those principles make sense? Are there things we should consider? Um, yeah, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. So I noticed something in the chat, um, yeah, David, please, um, but I'm trying to mm -hmm. find it. Yeah. I'm trying to find it because you guys have been great about putting loads of um, things in the chat and I'm trying mm. to find what it was now and I can't find it. Um, oh, OK, I don't know whether you can answer this from Patrick. What is your budget for comms around yeah. this mission? That's a question from Patrick. I don't know whether you can answer that while I'm looking for the other one. Yeah, David, think... are you able to answer that? I can't. Yeah. So in terms of communications budget, so the council has an internal communications team and the press office, and that's that's used for all council activities. So there's a whole team of specialists in the council who, who we can use to put out press releases or communications or help us with newsletters um, and things like that. Um, so that exists. I don't know what their budget is. Um, we have a, a budget within our team. Um, I guess my role is is kind of focused on a lot of this work, so I could say that, that that's allocated to this, but I don't know too much in terms of yeah. specifics. I think my answer to that, Patrick, would be is that if you had a magic wand um, and money, uh, and again, so we find innovative ways to do some of these things, believe you me, as a team. Um, what would you want, you know, to, to be able to collaborate better? And like some people have put there are too many communication channels. Mm -hmm. So maybe having yeah. something that's more focused, being clear what is being consulted on. And we argue that absolutely all the while. Um, the word consultation sometimes comes way before it's actually a consultation. Um, so actually it's about engagement, it's about co-production, it's about co-design, it's about working in partnership rather than consultant. So somebody's put C chat, so I'm presuming somebody's put some there. Um, I'm just going to create a community across Birmingham. I, I do like that idea. Um, so we can kind of to shout louder. Patrick says the council needs to shout louder. I uh, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, um, more stories in the local news bulletins would help. It has a big reach yeah. across the city. I think that's, a, again, you know, really good ideas. Uh, really do like we need more? Yeah, that yeah. Do we need more facilitators who work on the ground? I think that's absolutely fantastic idea. I love the idea of peer, your peer being, you know, and you being empowered to lead on this too, because you can have you know, a real influence in your local communities more than we can. Um, so I do like the idea of those peer to peer facilitators. I know that's not what you put, but I'm adding to that. So I think that's really great. You know, working more closely with stakeholders. In, and, and I think in that we should make sure that a major stakeholder is the people of Birmingham. Um, so create an app to see if local businesses would sponsor it and offer special deals. Is there anything more in the chat you want to bring? Amanda, uh, I just wanted to, to John. Um, there are in your local neighbourhood network scheme. Oh. There's loads of litter picking groups mm. that that you are have set up their own initiatives that go on. I know of many. Yeah. Um, John has also mentioned about a tower block. Tower block. So 
sounds like a few issues in the tower block. Yeah. Patrick says co-design co is great, but it rarely happens. Um, I'm not. I'm not thinking that that is wholly true in terms of what we see in, in the public participation team. Patrick yeah. can give you quite a few examples yeah. of um, of co-design, but I, I agree with the person that said we don't shout about it enough. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We need to engage more on social media. Yeah. Someone said ward meetings. I think we've already yeah. um, picked up on that one. Yeah. Green champions, David, you've said that as well. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. I think in the space, just to kind of pick up on Patrick's point, I think it's not, I think it, the, the co-design thing um, has been much more in adult social care than it has probably been in this space. To be fair, I think I kind of agree and disagree in that, that I think there are, there are elements. So my, my task to you is, is that if we do open up that space, I'm really hoping, Patrick, you'll be the first person to tick that box and say, I want to come and work in co-design with you guys. And I can see you laughing, but <laughs> yeah. So that's my challenge back to you. Um, I'm going to keep going through these. I love that you continue to ask ideas from us. I think that's really important. It's about how we hear your voice and have you at the centre of everything. Um, I'm going to, any any last things in the chat that you want to a uh, good point on student volunteering somebody just put so i'm going to move that to there um but anything you want to bring up amanda um simon has said perception is that the richer areas of birmingham better service are lobbied for in poorer areas expected to develop solutions and co-design when holding down three jobs mm -hmm. inequality mm -hmm. is an issue um yeah yeah. You've mentioned the student volunteering. Yeah. Conscious conscientious purchases encouraged by payment linked rewards. Yeah. yeah, I think incentives has come up a couple of times. Matthew, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Um Helen said, I'm not sure what CON is. 25 year plan to ensure the city has a fair park standard and access and accessible quality parks for all. Mm -hmm. And Chris said, choose councillors who represent the views of their constituents, not the views of the planners. I'm not quite sure what that means. Thank you, Chris. So back back to you, David. Um, again, it's not going to end. This will continue, and this is the beginning of our journey, not the end. So, David. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say some some really good questions. Yeah. I like the one about um educate the councillors as well because they're yeah. really important yeah. conduit to, to um, residents as well so that's something we are looking at at the moment too but yeah so this is the final slide of, of, of the day um, so it's just really we'll put this out on a follow-up feedback form if you if you want to answer if you've got more to say or any key points that you really want to iterate again um, does this all make sense what looks good or do you have any concerns about any of it are there any resources that you think I should should know about um with this work and as well i'm really interested in, in sort of any case studies uh, that you might have any community anything to do with communications behavior change or engagement yeah. done by local people local groups yeah. it'd be really great to spotlight some of that um in this work um oh. yes that is the end of it i'll just like to say a massive yeah. thank you it's been, yeah. it's been so really i'm brilliant. gonna open it up if that's okay david yeah, we've course. got 30 minutes ish um I am really again, if anyone wants to come in, make a comment, ask a direct question of it, of, of David or the team, et cetera, or volunteer to be involved, et cetera. Um, looking at you, Patrick. Um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I jest. Um, but yeah, please, if you pop your hand up, then it, it's dead easy for me then to follow it is. And Ewan, please come in first. <clears throat> yeah. Um this is, this is nice. It's lovely that there are so many nice ideas and all this. But you know what is missing is the real sense of panic here. And um, you know, IPCC said in 2019 we have to reduce our carbon emissions by 45 45 percent by 2030. 45 percent, and the emissions are going up. We're nowhere close. It needs it needs radical stuff. This and mm. for me, the two radical things are transport and food particularly meat and dairy. Those are, those are your big hitters. And I've said some stuff in the chat, but the big thing, the big thing is meat. Because meat is methane, that's about 40% of methane emissions is livestock. 
And if you want a quick fix, methane disappears in 12 years. It's hydroxylated in the troposphere. So you, you, somehow the city needs to say, eat less meat to the city. That's, that's really, that's absolutely core. And this isn't, you know, this isn't an animal welfare thing. This is because that's the only way you're going to do it. And that, to me, is maybe about planning applications, you know, preferentially um, giving approval to people that, that, that outlets that are vegetarian or vegan, really some strong messages about meat. And the other thing is you can't talk about cycling and disconnect it from cars. You have to get cars off the road, absolutely 100%. Yep. Because otherwise, everybody's talking about these being very distant things, but in, you know, we can see wars, famines, political unrest, droughts. That's going to hit us big time if we don't hit this by 2030. But because if we don't, I then, know. then it, everything's disappearing in the atmosphere so and, we're, and we're shot at. A yeah. lot of people are just going to... I'm just going to, I've got somebody who is, who's not on mute um, before I bring in Georgia. Um, I was going to say, can I respond to that one? Simon, yeah, please. Yeah, I was going to bring you in, David. Yeah, don't worry about that. Yeah. All right. Well, I was just say, you in. thanks so much. And I agree on a, on a lot of, a lot of that. I think the, the good thing I can say in response to your question is, and then a lot, lots of those, the thinking within the council is very much in line with what, lots, lots of what you've just said. So, for example, the Birmingham transport plan uh, that's been been done, you know, transport colleagues will will tell you that, you know, in order to achieve net zero, I think it's the reduction in car journeys is somewhere quite high, around the 80% mark. Um, mm -hmm. So we're well aware of that, the radical of, of the dramatic change in, yeah. in behaviour and, and that needs to occur. The difficulty is, of course, what's within our power to control and how, how we can fund and do a lot of that work. Um, that's the real challenge. But Colleagues in transport, and I know that uh, Councillor Clements is very upfront and embraced uh, that reality and um, with two hands. In terms of food um, and influencing people's diets, yeah, I think a really, really good point and, and you're spot on. I think um, one area we do have control and that sort of stuff is around procurement. So with schools and things like that, are we able to change the food procurement rules? Um, that's not a subject I know lots about what the council is doing there, but I do uh, I have met with my colleagues in the food systems uh, team who are very kind of on this sort of thing. Um, mm. But in terms of what we can do within uh, procurement law and, and local policy law, I'm not entirely sure. So that might be one to, to car park. Can I can I put to. that in the car park? Because I think it's a really important. Yeah. Um, there are things going on you in, um, and I'd love to put you into that space with those as well. But if if you're happy with that, uh, I'll just bring you, because I saw you put your hand up, um, and I, I want to bring in Georgia, but if, if you could just answer yes and no, if that's all right, I put in the car park and, and contact you outside of this. Happy with that? Yeah. Feels like you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, right. Food. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Georgia, thank you for being so patient. Then after you, it's going to be Bob. No worries. Um, thanks for that. Um, so I'm part of the business development team at Equan. So we operate the uh, and maintain the business, uh, the the Birmingham District Energy Scheme. Mm. And the you know the targets for the government is to get 18% of heat networks um, by 2050. You know with, with heat, and heat is 40% of our green green gas emissions. Um, I just wanted to sort of highlight, you know, our main, our main sort of challenges, uh, and how how maybe the council and and other people can sort of chip in and help and and comment. Mm -hmm. um, one of one of our main one of our main challenges is uh, heat density, which we're hoping that with heat zoning this will help. So we're getting uh, quite a few uh, connection requests coming through where the network is uh, maybe 700 metres away. And it's hard to justify the capital investment because um, of, you know, the, the returns. Um, so if we had more heat density through zoning, then we could easily um, put through uh, multiple buildings for that part, that capital investment uh so it would it, it would stack up um so that's one of our main our main ones uh the second one is involving um getting the district energy ready for low carbon technology so a lot of 
are connections, are older connections um, that are not ready to have temperatures for a heat pump. Mm -hmm. So we've got, um, we've actually applied recently for the HNES round um, heat network efficiency scheme for five of our substations in Birmingham to improve their return temperatures back to our energy centre and hence reduce gas um, gas consumption because we'll improve heat losses. Um, but it's also uh, ownership on the secondary um, side. Um, so we maintain the primary, um, but we've got a lot of commercial buildings and the heat network efficiency scheme doesn't have really much of a crit successful criteria for um, commercial building. It concentrates on res residential and so the successful rate of social housing going through will be higher than a lot of commercial buildings. But on the network, we have quite a bit of commercial buildings that are coming back at really high return temperatures. Mm. So I think it's something we should capture within the heat mm. network efficiency scheme as well. Um, and yeah, those are my two points. Uh, and I just want just wanted to highlight to David that, you know, it, it is, you know, we aren't shouting loud enough, um, you know, there's missed opportunities uh, and um, we want to start picking those up. Mm. Uh, so um, please get in contact uh, with me, David, and happy to get you um, in contact with our communication team. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Georgia. And I've written that down. Um, so again, we'll, it's not so much a car part, but it is. We'll, we'll make sure that afterwards you and David link up. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to pick up on there, David, before I bring Bob in. No, yeah, happy to I'd follow up on that. Brilliant. Great. Thank you, Bob. And after Bob, I've got you in again. So, Bob. Well, I want to refer to what a previous um, person said mm. about pressing the panic button and how we need very radical solutions very, very quickly. Otherwise, we're in serious trouble, which I think most of us would agree upon. And um, he referred to transport as being one of the biggies in terms of emissions. And, and so it is, alongside building the industry and commerce and food, etc., etc., etc. But on, on transport, I do think this is really an example where you need the big carrot before the sticks. Otherwise, you're going to get a huge public backlash mm -hmm. from the car owners and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to refer to a growing trend across Europe for fare-free public transport. Luxembourg brought it in a couple of years ago. Malta has now just joined the list. And there are many, many cities, particularly in France and Poland, that do the same. Dunkirk, Auvergne in um, France, um, Tallinn in Estonia and so on. And I think we should look at that and be pioneering in this region. So that would be the best inducement for people to get out of their cars, not mm. spending a huge amount of money on keeping a car going these days. So if the council could set up some sort of feasibility study to look into this issue, is mm. it viable? How could we do it alongside Transport for the West Midlands? I think that would be the kind of radical solution that we would need. Brilliant. Thank you, Bob. And again, I've noted that down because there are there are other. Unfortunately, I, I, I had a conversation with not unfortunately, I had a conversation with you and before this, but sometimes how the council works is that we kind of separate things. We're looking of sometimes to have that overview. So there is something that's in and around looking at transport, working with West Midlands. So again, I'd like to invite you to if we can get, you know, you involved and others in this, but Again, David, I didn't know if you wanted anything you wanted to. Yeah. Um, so that's yes, like you say, Bob, it's it's transport sort of organised by Transport for West Midlands and the council mm. Um, mm. and with public transport as it currently is in private ownership, there's only so much that Transport West Midlands can do. And I know they are reviewing that, yeah. that relationship as to whether yeah. they want to maintain it as a private partnership yeah. or bring into public ownership where they could yeah. do something like that where yeah. a feasibility study would make make good sense yeah. to me yeah brilliant thank you bomb thank you my um, i've got you in again and then after that it's nigel oh you in saying no thanks you in thank you mate uh, so nigel this follows uh first of all i'm wearing acox greener hat and um this follows actually very neatly from what the recent people have been saying, but the council is often perceived as being very slow. The route to net zero team in the last year 
has actually begun to transform that. So this is wonderful, but you're going to need to keep doing that and be really quick in order to overcome the previous cynicism, please. Mm -hmm. And taking a particular example, we have formed an ACOX Greener uh, car share club, and we have been trying for the last three years to get some electric charging points either at the railway stations or in mm. fact anywhere else mm. and we have failed so far totally mm. car share clubs enable people to not have a second car if we could get second cars off the road then this would immediately make our streets much easier to walk along cycle along etc and also if we could have electric vehicles then people could begin to see how much nicer it is driving an electric vehicle. So please, could we have some electric charging points for the ACOX Greener e-car share club? <laughs> Brilliant. I don't know if that's Within in our remit, less David. Than three years. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, it is yeah. something, just to let you know, we have, it is something on, on our radar as a team as well, um, because we don't have charging points within underneath Woodcock Street where many of our officers park at different points and um, but there isn't newly installed ones on the road outside so I think it's a it's a big big ongoing thing but David but thank you for that Nigel um, and, and again I'd like to contact you outside of this and and, and hear more about what you're doing so David. Yeah I, yeah I'll just echo that not especially on the topic of today's meeting but yeah, um, yeah as, as far as I'm aware the uh, electric vehicle charging point plan yeah. and rollout is sort of a, a structured program where yeah. they sort of said which which points they're doing first and I think it's around targeting yeah. taxi taxi um I forgot what they're called taxi hubs first and yeah. then moving into the local yeah. areas so it may well yeah. be that ACOX is on the list of, of points coming up but um yeah. we can't unfortunately you know if people lobby us then say okay yes we'll give you a, a charging point but I completely I sympathise with the car yeah. club and, yeah. and and what you're trying to do there and, and, yeah. and commend you on that. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Chris Martin, because we have a couple of Chris's. Yep. I think, okay, so uh, Chris Martin from Footsteps. <clears throat> I think I'd like to echo uh, Ewan's comments. I think what we're also needing is political leadership. Mm. Um, the climate emergency is one of the big, uh, one of the six grand challenges in the council's uh, business plan. And I think we need to hear it spoken out about more mm. and, you know, evidence that the major decisions that the council is making are, are actually being screened against the net, net zero um, requirements. Um, mm. uh, I was on the task force representing the faith communities and whilst we were there, the decision was being made about renewing the contract on the Tisley incinerator. And the ties to the incinerator is the biggest single source of emissions, as I understand, in Birmingham. So, um, you know, as well as sort of empowering community, I think we've got to have evidence from the top. And, uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that also we want <clears throat> leadership from national government. That's, but that's probably gone, going beyond the scope of this particular uh, um, call. Mm. Thank you, Chris. David. Yeah, I think a really good point and definitely yeah. somewhere where I think the council probably needs to hold its hands up mm. and admit where it might have taken taken wrong decisions. Um, yeah, I think that's all about that climate leadership we we're talking about. You can't say one yeah. thing and do the other. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the only I can't say too much about it, but the only thing I would say is um, it's definitely an organisation of this size. And I think it's been touched by some of the comments. It's, it's all about sort of pushing that message and making sure that we are able to to be in the know on, on what's going on everywhere basically and, yeah. and make sure that decisions aren't being made that go against the one yeah. of the council's main priorities um yeah. and sometimes it doesn't always happen um yeah. but yeah we are we are trying to address things like that yeah. i think yeah. yeah really good point and i think in that it's a, you you've got a really important role um as people of birmingham in you know picking who your political leadership is um that includes me as an officer you know not in my officer role but as somebody who sits here and and i'm and, and raising that so i think you know making sure all your counselors um and 
you know, part of what we're trying to do as a team is make our leadership, our corporate leadership team, much more accountable and open to involving citizens. And it was the first time in forever, wasn't it, Amanda, we managed to do something of that nature with our corporate leadership team only a few weeks back, um, which dramatically changed that. So again, it's definitely something that we we see. And again, it's about putting you in that leadership role with those decision makers. So thank you for that, Chris. And um, Simon, Simon Slater. Hi, uh, can, can you hear me OK? Yeah, all fine, Simon. Brilliant. The first time I've never been on mute. Great. Um, <laughs> well done. Just, uh, first of all, just a big thank you to everyone on the team that you've obviously spent a lot of time doing the research and presenting that. So I personally really appreciate the way you've done that. The point I would like to make is how are you going to get other people's views? So mm. you've got 150 people here, really brilliant ideas, really valid ideas. But I assume you've got no idea our demographics. Yeah. Um, and so there's an issue there about how do you test other ideas? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's exploring a citizen's jury or panel, but with a subsidy the size of Birmingham and yeah. the diversity, yeah. I expect local politicians can be very nervous yeah. about pushing forward certain suggestions if they haven't been tested in a representative way to Absolutely. give them the confidence to say that this is been tested by a representative group and city and worked through. So just, it's a really difficult ask, but just yeah. to say, you know, what sort of thoughts you're doing about that? Thank yeah. you. Do you mind if I come back on that, David, as well? Yeah, so absolutely. It's at the heart of everything we're trying to do at the moment as the public participation team to make sure that there is a real representation in this city uh, as much as you can get. Because the reality also is, is that as an authority, you know, we've marginalised communities down the years and um, societal wise communities have been marginalised and actually the many have lost trust. So actually it's very difficult to kind of open the door and say come in. So I think it's going to be a longer term process, but it is something we've got lots of ideas in and around. Um, so again, I think you're part of that solution, Simon, being part of there, asking that question is really important. Um, and like the colleague who put on there earlier on around, you know, talking to, you know, the Pakistani community, um, you know, my wife's Pakistani, there were very, people were very influenced and very quickly aware of climate change when the floods hit Pakistan. You know, there was a moment there that as an authority we could have and maybe should have done. So I think absolutely. Um, but I know it's part of what we've been talking about, David, and supporting you in that inclusive approach. So I'm just going to see if you've got any any anything you want to come in and as I say this is not the end we want to localize this and come down and do much much more um rather than doing it from on high but David yeah I think it's a really good point um and there are definitely big challenges in doing that mm. sort of lots of the points you touched on earlier about sort of people's time restrictions then if, you, if you're you know managing different jobs etc that mm. it's going to be harder to mm. participate in something that's kind of maybe seen as a nice to do uh whereas you're right if you've got a method like uh, a jury or a citizens panel or assembly mm, where people mm. are being paid for their time and it's yeah. a representative body that's one way of getting yeah. around that and making sure that yeah, yeah ideas do float with, the, with yeah. the general public and yeah and helping yeah. politicians make the decisions yeah. yeah um yeah it's just something to say like, looking into it and, and definitely yeah. have the process that i'm taking forward but again i've noticed that is to kind of contact that and we will everyone will get this off on to come and be more involved in in the public participation team's work and um, we want to be that facilitator of you of, of you being involved and being at that center but also learning how we could communicate better and involve communities and make sure that these things are representative um it's sometimes difficult because sometimes the space has and we started doing this for those who it's not that it's an, an elite as such, but there is a, a an element of, right, I've got the knowledge so I can be part of this. And if you don't, and if you've got those other issues going on, then maybe you don't think about being and, and having your voice. So 
really interested. Simon, expect an email and I'll be looking forward to having some of your thoughts on how we can do that. Um, I've got Georgia and then I've got Daniel. And then after that, I don't have anybody else. Um, but maybe those guys will take us to the finish line, as it were. So, Georgia. Hi there, thank you, Simon. Um, so just a just a few points. I think I've I've got I've been trying to collate what everyone's been saying. Mm. Um, I think the first one uh, I want to mention is uh, how to sort of capture uh, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And I just wanted to mention a um, a launch event that I went to. It was called Diverse Heat Network. Yeah. And okay. it really it really captured everyone um, because they shared some meaningful data right. of how okay. the heat network industry was going and how we needed 35,000 people and uh, just lots of information about the sector. Mm. And I'm not, you know, diving into heat networks here. I'm trying to make a point that actually creating something like a diverse green network yeah. where, you know, you've got and, and how it works is that, for example, the diverse heat network has different uh, companies that are members um, and each I think around about each company has about two or three uh, champions mm. that lead um, and help um, drive the things we want to concentrate, concentrate on I like recruitment um, data sharing um, and then we share with the wider in industry um, and the launch you know people put together from uh, Vattenfall, um, Equans, um, th there was quite a lot of companies um, and when it was launched it went really well and I just think maybe something like that would help drive private companies alongside council to make decisions. Um, just a thought. Um, and then the, the other thing I wanted to sort of come back to was uh, transport uh, and how to combine this with uh, energy. So like a tri system where you've got calling energy, uh, ca calling, heating and electricity. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much Birmingham is involved with sort of hydrogen and whether hydrogen is something that will um, come into play in the future. But uh, I'm just thinking along along the lines of having something set up uh in in like an ESCO form, like you have buildings where they've got EV, that have got um, solar panels, uh, plant rooms. You know, sort of thinking of a building and a and a smaller idea and making it bigger. Yeah. So yeah. having having like a, a space where you have hydrogen coming in, not just a, a, a one point supply in the city, not just for heat, but for cooling, heating, and electricity, and having EV points there. Um, it's just just another another point. Um, but yeah, I also just wanted to thank um, everyone on this call for making it so interactive as well. Uh, I like that we've been all been able to share our ideas. So thank you for that. No, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And if we can pick up again, I think outside of those meetings, some of those ideas and see where they go, etc. Uh, I just want to bring in Daniel because um, he's waited very patiently. Daniel, hi. You're still on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you didn't do what Simon did, but I got hugging. there in the end. There's a little bit of background noise, so I apologise for that. No, um, that's cool, mate. Like George, I've got a couple of points off on May. Mm -hmm. We work very closely with Birmingham already, and I'd just like to, to mention Nigel at ACOX Green as well, because we're doing a lot of work in that area at the moment under the LAD and HUG schemes. Um, so one of the points I was going to raise about awareness oh, and an interaction is people like Nigel and the ACOX Greener, yeah. Um, set up another. There's Mech Trust. There's a number of people we're working with that are really helping to drive these these projects on the ground, open people's doors for us, and get that mm. awareness out there and the engagement. Mm. And I think that's that's not to be sort of overlooked. It is very positive. Um, we do a lot with the schools in Birmingham. We're on the Civico contracts. So one of the things, the schools and the housing stock. There's still a big drive by Birmingham at the moment to replace gas boilers with new gas boilers, both on a commercial scale and on a domestic scale. And I think that's probably predicated on cost primarily. Um, and I think we really need to look at funding models, external funding models that we can assist you with to get away from that 
putting more carbon reliant heating systems back into mm -hmm. buildings and coming off it externally from Birmingham. We do a lot of work with the Department for Education directly. And we've got a number of schools we're putting in borehole fields at the moment, put in ground source heat pumps, tied in with extra building fabric approaches to make the building better insulated in the first place, so your heat loss is a lot less. Mm. And I think Birmingham are really missing the trick with trying to get external funding and, and reduce their reliance and their continued reliance on, on carbon efficient uh, or carbon fuels, particularly around mm. gas boilers and, and plant rooms, as an example. Mm. Um, so that is something we can help with and, and we are helping with with Birmingham and other clients as far as external funding is concerned. Mm. I think then that there does need to be a sea change in in the housing department and in the public building department about getting away from what we've always done and, and breaking yeah. the mould. And that, yeah. that comes back to the whole question through just about leadership and, and showing other people, other businesses, other industries within the city what can be done. It's got to start yeah. with the council. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Daniel. Thank, Thank you. For that. Any any comments, David? I like the idea of, of I, I know, I've, I've ringed my Nigel comment here um, because I, it makes me even more want to understand those local kind of networks, etc. So there's somebody else on my list afterwards who I'm going to be emailing. So look forward to speaking, hopefully more, Nigel. But David, and then I'm going to bring in you in and then we're going to kind of wrap it up. Yep. That, yeah, really interesting. And, and thanks for coming, yeah. Daniel. I think, um, yeah, I've heard exactly the same about the use of local groups in order to mm. advertise these um, retrofit schemes. So government yeah. funded um, work on improving people's insulation and, and boilers to, to heat pumps and things like that. Mm. So I think that really shows like how trusted messages and, and people in the community can can do a great job. Um, I'd be really interested to to follow up about your uh, mention of external funding yeah. for, for retrofit that, that Birmingham isn't taking advantage on. It'd be good to hear yeah. about that and put in touch with a colleague. Um, yeah, we'll we'll pick that up outside of this. That's brilliant. But yeah, I've wrote I'll that down as well. Um, Ewan. Yeah, final final question to try and well, it's a it's a it's a request really more than a question. Um, okay. One of the things that Birmingham constantly bangs on about, and you know, the evidence is I suppose there is it's man proud manufacturing base. For years, I've been banging on saying that this city should have a manufacturing base for electric bikes, and you're clearly an advocate for them, Simon. They are remarkable. They, they are transformational in terms of the way you can get around, and they are as close to carbon neutral as you can possibly get. Yeah. I do not understand why Birmingham has not approached you know, a major bike manufacturer, somebody like Orbea, the Spanish firm, who are social enterprise, mm -hmm. saying, would you like to build electric bikes? We've got a market of, you know, 1.2 million people. Would you like to build some electric bikes in the city? They'd probably bite your hand off if you know if you could give them a decent sized property and area. And that, that seems to me just like a, a no brainer. And and you've also got the opportunities for youth unemployment and all sorts of stuff. You know, it could yeah, be a yeah. could be a major yeah. win 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 situation. So I think that's something that uh, whether that comes through transport or environment, I don't know which department. That yeah, comes. no, I think it's it really, really just seems such, seems such an obvious thing to do. Anyway, yeah. I at that point. I think it sits in, in a little bit in our world, actually, Amanda, if you think about the and Cam, I've just realised that Cam's here and she's not on my list on that on there. So I'm, I'm going to get afterwards and correct this slide. Um, but but absolutely only meeting with Richard Brooks in the um, strategy employment, uh, strategy equality and partnership directorate. I will get it right. It's been, only been five months since we've been going. So I, it's excuse me. But he talked about having that and, and actually having a conduit in for those kind of ideas. So, again, I've, I've got that. Uh, um, and I think, again, it's something we can feed in through our world um, not necessarily through David, but again, into um, we've got a, a group that is looking at a part of the, our directorate at business, how it's working, what investments needed. And I think something like that, you know, instead of having the kind of pedal bikes, you know, all over. We could have something really interesting with half of those being the electric bikes. Um, there are there are contradictions in that about how they how they left and people with visual impairment and so on and so forth. But I think you know, 
for me, electric bikes is the way forward for again around people with a disability. And um, I couldn't cycle for years until I got mine and now it's joyous. So I am an advocate, but I can only do so much. Um, so David, but thank you, Ewan. David, any any thoughts on that? And then Yeah, no, just just a massive thank you. Uh really interesting comments, really mm -hmm. useful. Um yeah. So I think I think one of the things that we might want to do, um, and it's just popped in my head, is when because we will send you out afterwards bike hangers. Uh, Sandra's uh, bike hangers for a long while. I I I do like a good bike hanger, but the problem for me is my bike's a little bit too heavy for me to hang. <laughs> but I do like, um, and again, I will send a link out. Or if you want to tell people what bike hangers are, Sandra, um, more than happy. But um, but I think for us now, one of Sandra quickly bike hangers uh yes they're they're um uh, they're um those uh, containers for bikes there yeah. on the ground yeah uh, i didn't have my camera on uh yeah so that they're, they're, that's what they are um they've got them outside um the uh birmingham friends of the earth building outside yeah. the warehouse yeah 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 and, and again we'll send out a link to the new um the new bike park that's connected to um, New Street because that's really useful. I've just started using that completely free. Your bike is secure, etc. So it makes cycling to the city much more attractive again. Um, but right, so I think what we'll do is um, we'll email you all afterwards with um, an evaluation of how do you think the meeting went. But also I think it'd be really good to, I think, adding in there, and I don't know what David thinks, but to try and capture your networks. I think that'd be really interesting exercise. What networks do you know of that exist in your area that you can feed back into David? Um, because if we're going to start communicating out, we want to be able to give to you to empower. Um, so again, that could sit within our team, within the comms team. But I don't know what you think, David, but it clearly seems as people have large networks here. We don't know what they are, but it'd be really nice to kind of have a bit of an overview. Um, so we could ask that question in there um, yeah, and get definitely. back. Yeah, definitely. We're really keen to make sure that, especially with groups who are already working, this supposed to be kind of a regular point of contact. Absolutely. Think, yeah, we've looked at you know, the BBSC Energy and Environment Network meetings and trying to have regular attendance at those, but it'd be great to know about why the yeah. networks people are in. Yeah. So I spoke at one o'clock, which is really efficient. We finished on time. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody uh, so much. It was a really great meeting and um, some really great ideas. We will feed back everything. This is the beginning of a journey. This is the beginning of that that discussions and etc. So uh, we will keep you in the loop. I think there may be things where we want to dig really deep down in and we may pull different meetings at different points. But essentially, yeah, we um, we will be back in touch very short. So um, really just from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for really engaging uh, and, and being part of today. So thank you. And thank you, David, for all the work you put in for the slides and everything. I know it's been we've had numerous iterations over the last few days to make sure that you guys have got as much information uh, as you can. So thank you. My pleasure. Thanks yep. for coming. And, yeah, okay, well, at one minute past, I'll end the meeting and thank everybody so, so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a good afternoon. Bye. 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 Bye.
May 2007. He has never been charged in connection with Madeline's disappearance and has denied any involvement. The search involves Portuguese and German police, while officers from the UK are also present. It is expected to last until at least 